the rules for command and colors Napoleonics. It's a one versus one war game, which is set on the Napoleonic era. Uh, one side plays as the French, the blue pieces, and the other side plays as the British, the red pieces, and the Portuguese, the brown pieces. The stats of the Portuguese units are slightly worse than the stats of the British units. The very first thing you want to do is to decide which scenario to play. And once you make your choice, you should set up the battlefield. We have infantry, cavalry, and artillery units. Each unit consists of a particular number of blocks. Once all the blocks of that unit are destroyed, then we say that the unit is destroyed. We also have leaders or generals. They can either be loan or they can be attached to a unit. This is a victory points game. So the first person who collects a required number of victory banners wins the game. You gain a victory banner each time you kill an enemy unit or an enemy leader. The board is divided in three sectors or flanks, right, center and left, by these dotted lines. And for example, we can say about this hex that it belongs both to the right and the center. Each player has a particular number of command cards, and there are two types of command cards. The section cards, these cards with the arrows, they're very easy to understand. So, for example, this card issues an order to two units or leaders on the left flank. This one issues an order to one unit or leader in its section, one unit or leader on the right flank, and so on and on. And uh, finally, we also have the tactics cards. We just have to read the text of the cards, but for example, this particular card is in order to four fewer artillery units. So these artillery units can be anywhere. They don't have to be in a particular section. And now I will explain the turn sequence. First of all, you play a command card. Uh, the command card, you have to decide which units you order. And then we have the movement phase. So the units that have been issued and ordered by you can be moved one by one. Then we have the combat phase, so the units that have been issued and ordered may battle one by one. And finally, you have to draw a new card from the draw deck. If the draw deck is depleted, then we shuffle the discard pile and we create a new draw deck. So how does the movement work? Um, most infantry units can move one hex and battle. But light infantry units also have an extra option. They can move two spaces and not battle. Light cavalry can move up to three spaces and battle. Heavy cavalry can move up to two spaces and battle. Foot artillery units can move one space, but if they do that, they cannot battle. Horse artillery units can either move one space and battle, or two spaces and not battle. Attached leaders move together with a unit. Lone leaders can move between one and three spaces, but lone leaders cannot battle. You cannot move your units through other units. The only exception is for lone leaders, Lone leaders can pass through friendly units. There is a limit of one unit per hex. You can detach um, a leader from a unit by issuing him an order. So if you give him an order, you can move him somewhere else. Okay, so a unit which moves to a space where you have a lone leader cannot move farther in that turn. Also, if you move a leader to a unit, then this doesn't order the unit that the leader has just joined. And by the way, the unit cannot move farther that turn. Now let's discuss combat. There are two types of combat, melee and ranged combat. Melee is when the target unit is adjacent to your unit for example, this unit here can attack that unit in melee. Ranged combat 
is when the enemy unit is within firing range. The firing range is two spaces for most infantry units. For example, this unit here can shoot at that enemy unit over there because it's two spaces away. For artillery units, the firing range is usually up to five spaces and cavalry units can only attack in a melee. By the way, if a unit is adjacent to an enemy unit, then it cannot do ranged combat. For example, this unit here cannot shoot at that British unit over there because currently it is adjacent to that enemy unit. Therefore, in this turn, if you want to combat with this unit, you can only attack in melee over there. Okay, in the case of ranged combat, the first thing we have to do is to check if we have a clear line of sight. Because if there are other units between our firing unit and the target unit, then they block the line of sight. Also, there are some types of terrain which block the line of sight. For example, this unit here cannot fire that unit because this forest in the middle blocks the line of sight. Hills also block the line of sight. However, there's a special rule here. here. An artillery unit on a hill can fire over the heads of an adjacent friendly unit on a lower terrain. So this artillery here would be allowed to fire at that unit over there, over the heads of this adjacent friendly unit on a lower terrain. So if we have a clear line of sight, the next thing we should do is to determine the strength of our range attack. This means how many dice we can roll. Uh, the more dice we can roll, the better. If we choose our infantry unit to fire still without moving, then usually the number of dice that we can roll is equal to the number of blocks of the non-moving infantry units. Uh, light infantry and some guard units can roll one extra die. And by the way, British units also roll one extra die if they choose to fire without moving. Um, okay, so if you choose to move and fire, then you roll fewer dice. Usually it's half the number of dice that you would normally roll if you had chosen to not move, to fire without moving. So you don't have to remember any of these numbers because we have this reference card here which explains us how many dice we should use each time. So, for example, let's say that we have a line infantry unit and we fire without moving, standing ranged fire. Then if our unit has four blocks, then we can use four dice. If our unit has two blocks, we use two dice and so on and so on. If we move and fire and we have four blocks, we roll two dice. If we have two blocks, we roll one die and so on and so on. Uh, for artillery, uh, the number of dice that you can roll depends on how far away the target unit is. The closer it is to your artillery, the more dice you can roll. This reference card explains us, again, how many dice we can use. So, for example, for foot artillery that fires at an enemy unit, which is four spaces away, we roll one die. If the enemy unit is three spaces away, then we roll two dice. Okay, so once we determine how many dice we are allowed to roll, we roll them, and we score one hit for each troop symbol rolled that matches the target unit. If we want to destroy an infantry unit, we need to roll this. Cavalry, artillery. So you may notice that inf the infantry symbol exists twice, so it's more likely, it's easier to destroy an infantry unit compared to other types of units. Now, in the case of melee combat, First of all, we have to determine the strength of the melee attack. Uh, usually it's one die per block. Some elite troops get an extra die, and as a general rule of thumb, the friends usually are better in melee. We roll the dice, and it's the same as before, but this time, sabers also score hits against a unit of any kind. In other words, it's easy to destroy a unit in melee but uh, there is a drawback here. If the enemy unit survives and does not retreat, 
and I will explain in a minute what retreating is. Then, after you battle them in melee, they are allowed to battle you back, which means that it's going to be their turn to determine how many dice they can roll, and they will roll them against you, and you will potentially suffer casualties. The reference card can help us to determine how many dice we can roll. So, for example, let's say that we would like to attack from here to there with our four blocks of light cavalry. Then we go to the reference card and we find out that we have light cavalry, it's French light cavalry, we are attacking in melee, we have four blocks, so we can use four dice. And now it's time to explain you what retreat means. If your unit is attacked, it doesn't matter if it's ranged combat or melee, then for its flag, which is rolled against it, your unit must retreat backwards one hex. It's one hex per flag, and it's backwards, which means that sideways retreating is not allowed. If the retreating unit joins a lone leader, then the leader stops the retreat. For example, let's say that this unit here was attacked, and two flags were rolled against it, then it has to retreat two spaces backwards. But as they go here, they join the lone leader, so he stops the attack. If you cannot complete the retreat, because there are some units that block your way backwards, or because of some impassable terrain, then you have to lose one block for each hex you are supposed to retreat, but cannot do so. So, for example, let's say that this unit here was attacked and two flags were rolled against them, because there is a river here which doesn't allow them to go backwards, they lose two blocks. Sometimes you have the option to ignore retreating flags. You can ignore one flag if your unit has one attached leader. Uh, you can also ignore one flag if your unit is adjacent to at least two friendly units. Some elite units also have the ability to ignore some flags, and sometimes there might be some terrain effects. And all these effects are cumulative, so you may be able to ignore multiple flags. Now we'll explain you what the leader casualty check is. Uh, this must be done if a unit with an attached leader loses at least one block due to combat or retreat which could not be completed. Then we roll two dice and uh, if two sabers are rolled then the leader dies and you have to give uh, a victory banner to your opponent. Uh, otherwise, the leader survives and nothing happens to him. So there's just 1 over 36 chance that the leader dies like that. However, if the unit is completely destroyed, then we do the leader casualty check with just one die. And if we roll sabers, the leader dies. Uh, and you give a victory bonus to the enemy. Otherwise, if he survives, he must retreat. He must go backwards between 1 and 3 spaces. If his retreat route is blocked because of other units or because of impassable terrain, then the leader dies and you must give a victory banner to the enemy. For example, here, if this unit is destroyed, the leader survives the casualty check, but then he cannot retreat backwards because of this river, so he dies and you still give a victory banner to the enemy. If your leader, if this unit dies and the leader go backwards and reaches the edge of the board, then you are allowed to get over the board and uh, you don't have to give a victory banner to the enemy if you do that. By the way, a lone leader cannot be shot because at those times it was considered to be unethical to do that. But you can attack an enemy leader, an enemy lone leader, in melee. And uh, if, you roll, if you roll at least one saber, then you kill him. Otherwise, if he survives, he must retreat. From now on are additional optional actions. Let's start with infantry taking ground. This means that if you use an infantry unit to attack the enemy in melee, then if the enemy unit dies or retreats, 
let's say that you're attacking from here to there, then you can uh, move your infantry unit to the space which was previously occupied by the enemy. This is called infantry taking ground. Cavalry breakthrough is the same thing, but for, it works for your cavalry. So let's say that you're attacking from here to there, the enemy retreats or they die, then you can move your cavalry unit there. But now you also have an extra option to move one additional space afterwards and you're also allowed to do a bonus attack. But if you win again, this time you cannot uh, move another space. All right, so now we'll explain cavalry, retire and reform. If your cavalry unit is attacked by an enemy infantry unit in melee, you can retire and reform. This means that you move two hexes backwards and the enemy unit, the enemy infantry unit, still rolls their dice but this time we only mind the cavalry symbols. Only this score hits against your cavalry. Any sabers or flags which are rolled against you have no effect this time. Uh, forming square. If an infantry unit of yours is attacked by enemy cavalry, then you can form a square as long as you have at least three remaining command cards. Then you take one of these square counters, you put it there, and at the same time the opponent randomly picks one of your command cards and this must be placed here. It remains there until you come out of square, in which case this goes back to your hand and we have to return the square counter. Okay, so even though now you're the defender, because you're in square and you're attacked by enemy cavalry, you are the first one to roll one die and against the enemy cavalry and any flags that you roll against them they cannot be ignored by the enemy cavalry if they don't retreat then of course it's their uh, go afterwards to roll one die one die against you so we see that being in square offers an advantage here uh, it's an advantage of infantry against cavalry however there is one drawback here that because you're uh, infantries in square are stationary, so any flags rolled against them, if they cannot be ignored, then the result in you losing a block per flag, because you're stationary and, and you cannot retreat. Okay, so if you want to attack while you're in square in the future, then you only roll one die which means that you're vulnerable if there are other enemy infantry or artillery units nearby which can attack you because they can use multiple other dice, but you can only use one die to fight them back. In addition, when you are in square, you cannot ignore a flag by being adjacent to two friendly uh, units. Uh, therefore, it might be a good idea to have a general attached to your infantry in square so uh, that you can ignore one flag which is rolled against you. All right, uh, you can come out of square by issuing an order to your unit in square, but you cannot come out of square if there is still an enemy cavalry unit adjacent to your unit in square. Now we'll explain what the combined arms combat concept is. It can be used when an infantry or cavalry unit attacks in melee. Then one or more ordered artillery units, which have clear sight of the target, can add the number of their dice to the number of dice of the attacking unit in melee. Uh, therefore, now every saber symbol will result in scoring a hit. What does this mean? That if, for example, if you are attacking uh, with this cavalry unit from here to there and you have also ordered this artillery unit um, then you can combine the dice of this and that and if you had just attacked this with your artillery unit then any sabers that you rolled wouldn't score you a hit because you're not attacking in, me in melee but now that you're combining the dice of this and that any sabers that you score that you roll score you a hit. But this thing cannot work uh, if your artillery fires over the heads of a friendly unit. Then you cannot do combined arms combat. Um, 
So let's talk about terrain. Some terrain types offer some protection. For example, hills, forests, and especially cities. And they offer protection, which means that the attacker might have to they, they reduce the number of dice that the attacker rolls. Uh, by the way, units that move to forests or cities must stop for this turn and they cannot battle uh, during this turn. Some terrain types also reduce the dice of an attacking unit located there. So, for example, if you have horses or artillery attacking out um, a forest or a city, they will have to reduce their dice. And by the way, squares cannot be formed in cities. We also have this terrain reference card here, which informs us about any potential dice deductions. So, for example, let's say that we want to attack with our infantry unit into a town, then we have to deduct two dice from our attacking strength. But if we want to attack out a town with our infantry unit, this time there are no disadvantages. If we use a cavalry unit to attack into a town, we have to deduct three dice. But this time, if we want to attack out a town with a cavalry unit, again, we have to use to deduct three dice from our attacking strength. So in about just 20 minutes, you already know almost all of the rules of the game. I will end up discussing a few subtleties, the very last few rules. They're not so frequently used, but it is it still is a good idea to know them. Uh, there are a few command cards that give extra dice to the attacker. For example, we have this cavalry charge card. It says that you may issue an order to four or fewer cavalry units, and each of these cavalry units will battle with one additional die. But these cards uh, are useless when you want when you use a cavalry unit to attack an infantry unit in square. You don't get in such a case you don't get any benefit from those cards. You can only attack an infantry unit in square with your cavalry with just one die. However, you may want to use combined arms combat when you're attacking an infantry unit in square with your cavalry to, to actually be able to use more dice, more than just one die, to attack them. The infantry unit in square can also use combined arms combat to attack uh, other units with more than just one die. A leader which is attached to a unit in square cannot be ordered to detach as long as the unit it is still in square. First you have to come out of square and then you can detach the leader. Uh, remember that I told you that there are some terrain types that when you enter them you should stop moving. For example, forests. If you normally enter a forest, you have to stop moving. But uh, if the unit is retreating, this terrain types will not stop the retreat. For example, let's say that this unit has to retreat two spaces backwards, then maybe they will go there and then there again. The forest will not stop their retreat. Finally, a retreating leader whose unit was destroyed can pass through enemy units, but for every hex with an enemy unit it passes through, the enemy rules dies to try to merely kill the retreating leader who tries to escape. In this case, the leader doesn't benefit from terrain dice deductions. Um, if he survives, he can continue his retreat. For example, let's say that we have this British unit here and this British unit there, and they attack our light cavalry. The unit dies, the leader survives the leader casualty check, and then he's trying to, to retreat backwards. Because currently his way is blocked by enemy units, um, he can temporarily pass through enemy units, but they will roll their dice to try to melee kill him. So if they roll at least one saber, then they kill him. Uh, otherwise, he survives and he can continue his, his retreat backwards. All right, uh, that should be all. You know everything you should know to play this game. It is my favorite horror game, and I hope that you will have some good time playing it.